Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the WBSA first online coaching workshop. Evening. Uh, how are you, Gary? Yeah, um, Fred, thanks. Yeah, keep your microphones on mute, please, everybody. <laughs> All right, uh, we will start uh, at uh, six o'clock as uh, scheduled. Uh, as discussed on the group, anybody who joins us late or doesn't uh, make the workshop uh, tonight will be able to watch it online afterwards. Um, just a couple of house rules on screen. If you guys could just change your screen names to your actual names. You know, some of you still have your phone names, etc. cetera. So if, uh, appreciate it if you could just change your names. Um, when you have a question, raise your hand, although we would prefer the presentation uh, present, presenter to finish the presentation before questions. Um, and then um, if you do, if you feel like you don't want to ask a question on on your on the microphone, please just uh, type it in the chat box and we'll get to that question. All right. For, first and foremost uh, this evening, my name for those of you who don't know, it's Jerry Smith. I'm the High uh, Performance Director and uh, High Performance and Coaching Director. And online, we also have uh, Mr. Charles Saunders, the CEO of uh, Wheelchair Basketball South Africa, as well as Sipaman Gumbi, the uh, Head of Coaching for WBSA. Uh, we are going to start with uh, the safeguarding uh, presentation, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Saunders to please uh, uh, present that and then following following that we will move on to the uh, coaching pathway so without further ado charles over to you thank you very much and welcome everybody uh the host is muting me when i start to talk so thank you very much <laughs> i'm going to ask the host please just to allow me to share my screen uh, one second, I'll do that for you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, you should be able to. Thank you very much. Let me check it out. Okay, so I'm going to, this is going to be interactive, and I know that uh, the, the um, uh, host has turned around and said that ask questions, et cetera, et cetera, but with safeguarding, unfortunately, it's going to have to be an interactive policy where I'm going to talk to you, ask you questions, and I need feedback from everybody, please. So to start off, what do you understand when I turn around and say, Safeguarding. Open to the floor. Uh, I would say um, safeguarding children's um, uh, privacy, their information. Okay, you're on the right track. Anybody else? All right, so safeguarding is a document that has been drawn up to save not only children, but what we call as vulnerable people from abuse, from neglect, from harassment, and so on and so on. So when we talk about safeguarding in particular, we, we need to understand that there's a statement that has been put out by the World Association, and it says that um, it's a responsibility of organizations. This is an organization called Wheelchair Basketball South Africa uh, to make sure that their staff, all their volunteers, operational people, and the programs that revolve around wheelchair basketball in this country, as well as in Africa, that we do not harm children or vulnerable people. Okay, now there's a particular group of people that we refer to. When we talk about harassment and abuse, we talk about children, which is the little 
happens. Uh, we talk about young adults under 18 years and under, people with both mental and or physical disability. Then they talk about competitive athletes. Now, a competitive athlete is someone that falls under the high performance program. These would be uh, national athletes, athletes that are training out for, for national teams. Um, it would be provincial um, athletes that are, are applied for colors and are playing for provincial competition. It covers all women, whether disabled, uh, whether able-bodied, it makes no difference. Elderly people, so in wheelchair basketball, refer to them as masters. And then it includes the vulnerable adults, which is the LBQTG community, in other words, the gay community. And we have to recognize that the safe, that this, this program that we're going to talk about safeguards every person equally. And we need to understand that the training of the safeguard policy follows a couple of legalities, uh, which affects everybody. So when we talk about a safeguarding policy, we need to have a look and see what brought the safeguarding policy about. Why do we have it? Just a couple of hard little facts for everybody. South Africa is rated as the highest, and I'm very sad to say this, the highest country stats of all countries throughout the world where there is woman abuse. It also has a very, very frightening stat of in the region of 170,000 odd children that go missing on an annual basis. When I say missing, I don't say runaways. I say missing, never been able to trace the game. And this puts us up very, very high with countries like Brazil, USA, Great Britain, where sex trafficking has been known to actually um, um, abduct children, adopt women, and remove them from society completely, never to be seen again. So when we looked at this, South Africa was known to have been one of the countries that created a Bill of Rights that was outstanding. There was nothing in the world that ever touched it. Unfortunately, we cannot be proud of our Bill of Rights because when it talks about unfairly discrimination, directly or indirectly against anybody on the grounds of race, gender, sex, pregnancy, which we suffer very, very badly with in schools at the moment, where a young lady is pregnant and cannot continue her education, marital status, ethnic, social origin, color, sexual orientation, age, disability, another sore point within South Africa at this given time as disability are not really looked upon, as, as um, uh, by government has been an entity that is discriminated against, religion, conscience, belief, culture, language, and birth. And as a South African, I have to turn around and say that our Bill of Rights do not accommodate everything that we have put on paper. It also recognizes that everybody has an inherent dignity and a right to have their dignity respected. And again, I have to pull holes and, and, and show that, that people of disability are not looked upon in this country where their dignity is respected and protected. And then it says that everybody has the right to be free of all forms of violence. And this is something very sadly lacking in our country in the fact that we have the highest woman abuse in, in the world. And it's, uh, it's something whereby we have to really and truly look at these words and say, have we as a society, have we as a sport, have we put all the compliance we need to do to look after our people? So the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child Act of 1995, the South African Bill of Rights of 96, the National Sports and Recreation Act of South Africa of 98, the Children's Act 38 of 2005, and then the International Committee, the IOC consensus statement which, on harassment and abuse in sport of 2016, including the Protection from Harassment Act 2010, South Africa, and then 197 nations 
adopted the safeguarding policy, stating that sport as a whole must be free of all types of harassment. It's a very big call. And unfortunately, I do understand after studying this document, it's 75 pages long, after studying this document, why it is a necessity to introduce this particular policy within sport. Now, as wheelchair basketball, uh, we embarrassingly have to turn around and say that we have to introduce this into our, into our curriculum, into our compliance documentation, because we are just as guilty as any other sporters. We suffer terribly from abuse and neglect. So when we talk about harassment, sexual harassment, abuse, there are many things that need to be taken into, con into consideration. We are a society, a culture, where harassment amongst us males with females and vice versa is unfortunately, and I've got to be very careful how I say certain things now because this document uh, precludes me from saying things, but the one thing that, that we live with in this country, and I asked this question on, on several of the community platforms that I've been dealing with over the last couple of weeks, around the country. How many ladies have suffered the embarrassment of having males that come onto them in bars, that whistle at them, that touch their buttocks, that in some way or another have made the person directly or indirectly feel that somehow they have felt harassed. And out of the questions that I asked amongst everybody, I was very shocked to see that all the ladies in the audience had put up their hand and said they had, in one way or another, been harassed in their lifetime. So this is a big concern for me because this harassment is actually unknown by the person that is doing the harassment. They do not feel any guilt in the fact by whistling, making comment, um, um, flirting, et cetera, et cetera. And they are not aware whether it causes harm or inspires the reasonable belief that it can cause harm because they're not aware of it. So when we talk about harassment, it covers a lot of aspects. And within sport, we're going to go into it very clearly within the sport aspect as well. Sexual harassment. Now, when we look at the terminology or the definition of sexual harassment, it means any unwarranted or unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, whether it be verbal, nonverbal, or physical. This is a big concern because in wheelchair basketball, South Africa, we have unfortunately experienced this on a number of occasions. We've dealt with it through our disciplinary process, but at the end of the day, this document now defines quite clearly that when it becomes a sexual harassment, it becomes now a criminal case and is no longer dealt with internally. And then we talk about abuse. So not only sexual abuse is in this particular environment. We talk about psychological abuse, and, and, it, and psychological abuse includes humiliation, intimidation, intimidation, and, of course, the demeaning of a person's self-worth. Now, now, I see this with coaches coaching, where he embarrasses particular players on the basketball court. <laughs> and he does so to, to motivate that particular team, but at the same time, unaware of the psychological abuse that can be caused. Physical abuse. This is where a coach would hit a player on the shoulder or take his fist and fist bump the player in the chest. And it states here quite clearly that physical abuse that causes physical trauma, not necessary injury, but forms trauma where the athlete is at such a point that he feels that if he does ABC, he's going to be punished in a particular way. We spoke about sexual abuse. Okay. And this means any type of conduct of a sexual nature. We talk to referees and say, referees, do not pick up 
a woman player off the floor. Because if you do so, and your hand brushes against her breast, you can be held up for sexual abuse. So rather, do not engage in matters like this. Do not engage in the factor where somebody talks to you and you tap the person's backside. Because if that person lays a sexual abuse charge against you, you will be criminally charged. Neglect. I'm going to retain a little story that took place many, many years ago. And I'm talking around about 2006, 2007, where we had young kids that were traveling and participating in national championships. And this was in wheelchair basketball as well. And we were embarrassed on the fact that these young kids would arrive and in classification, we would have to put their feet in a basin of warm water so that we could remove their socks because they had worn their socks for so long that when you pull the sock off, you pull the skin off as well. Now, this is a big concern because these kids are coming out of special schools. They're coming out of rehabilitation homes. They're coming out of families. And when you see it and suddenly you experience it, you start finding out very clearly that neglect is in many different ways. A coach with neglect, the team management with neglect, not looking for pressure sores on their players before a camp starts. Not looking for injury to the player before a game starts. This is all under the umbrella of neglect. There is a situation whereby we have many, many, many of our rural athletes that come through that are wearing the same catheter for the last three, four months. They're already suffering from tract infections, urine tract infections. And then we find out that, hold on, this young man has worn the same catheter or using the same catheter for the last three months, has no finance to get new catheters, are coming out of clubs, coming out of rural areas, coming out of schools, with unhygienic products. Now, this all involves us as wheelchair basketball. It involves us to such an extent that this policy has had to now be drawn up to identify where we are lacking in monitoring our athletes. So they've created this, and they've said that there's anonymous reporting and that the agency has been um, um, effective under SASCOC, and this agency uh, re works directly in line with the South African Police's uh, Child Protection uh, Unit. And what happens is that anybody within the community, as what we have spoken about, uh, where we talk about the vulnerable um, a group of people, that they have a, a, a right to privately communicate with such groups called the Guardian Sport or the Sport Voice or SSBS uh, crime line and report such things as harassment, sexual harassment and abuse without being known as whistleblowers, without being confronted and then experiencing physical abuse. Now, when we talk about this, this document was originated out of Gymnastic South Africa. And what was happening is they were finding out that the coaches in Gymnastic South Africa, especially in the high performance program and out of um, certain areas of the community, were abusing both young males and young females. And this had been continuing for a very, very long time. And eventually, when it was addressed, there was a lot of the, those kids who became adults and suffered terrible psychological abuse. And because of this, we decided very clearly that we would endorse this product and put it in play and make awareness from every aspect of our game, every aspect of our members, to ensure that they all physically understand 
when we talk about safeguarding, it does not only mean looking after children. It means looking after all those that cannot look after themselves. So when we need to understand what the safeguarding policy is about, it says that we need to ensure that athletes and others who all take part in WBSA can do so without fear of harassment or abuse. Now, this opens up avenues because a lot of coaches have said to me, oh, you're tying our hands. It means we can't shout at the player. It means we can't do this. We can't do that. No, guys, it doesn't mean that. It just means that policy for safeguarding is put in play where all forms of harassment and abuse will not be tolerated. And as a result of that, it provides the victim with an avenue to report this matter and then an enforcement agency to be put in play to deal with every report that comes through in an unbiased, fair manner in which we get to the bottom of the report. And this is what it basically says. It enables anybody um, who has witnessed, very important, who has witnessed or experienced harassment or abuse within the confines of this report to, without fear of victimization or retaliation, be able to have an avenue to report the matter. And when we talk about this, we need to ensure that we have implemented everything possible that we can do from the office to ensure that all, me all measures are put in place and that the likelihood of incidents of harassment and abuse is lowered in the community as a whole. When we talk about roles and responsibilities, it talks about federation administrators. So you as, pro as provincial members, you as coaches, head of coaches, uh, classifiers, referees, all clubs, all staff, all volunteers, and of course, within the actual management structure of the coaches, you all need to understand, accept, and adopt the safeguarding policy and procedures. Now, the question is, what happens if I do not sign off this document? What happens if I do not attend these particular workshops? Can I continue acting in my current portfolio as a coach? The answer is yes, you can. However, your province, your association, your club management, WBSA, can and will be held accountable up to a fine of 55,000 rand or two years imprisonment if you have not implemented these minimum requirements. So what this document turns around and says is that all of these members that I've mentioned, federation, pro province, clubs, staff, coaches, management, all of you have to adopt the safeguarding policy and procedures and sign it as acceptance. We have to ensure that all of our provinces, regions, clubs and WBSA, all have a safeguarding officer in play. So what we have done as a result of this, we have turned around and said that our women's rep and our players rep that is positioned within wheelchair basketball's provincial structures will be the safeguarding officers. So where there is a situation where there's a male players rep and a female uh, women's rep, we can then be comfortable and turn around and say that those are the people that have been appointed as safeguarding officers, have been trained up within the safeguarding policy and making sure that everything that we are saying and doing in this document okay, is adhered to. We need to make sure that whenever we conduct an event, that there's a safeguarding officer present. We need to do a risk assessment. How do we do a risk assessment? Well, it's to establish within the actual structure of wheelchair basketball, is there a threat of abuse, firstly? Secondly, under the risk assessment, are there measures, safeguarding measures that have been put in place so that if there is somebody that has been abused, that they have that opportunity or avenue to report the matter without fear of victimization. We need to ensure the safety and welfare of all of our members at this event. We need to ensure that at least one suitable, trained, competent, safe arding officer has been designated and is present at these events. Now, this is a lot of man hours and a lot of work. 
Okay. So therefore the responsibility falls upon those people that are appointed. And the reason why I've said that uh, between the clubs and competitions, every single club will have one safeguarding officer. Every single province will have the women's rep and the players rep that are safeguarding officers. And then we need to ensure that all of our coaches, all of our management are police cleared before they coach. Now, guys, I know this is a, a big ask of everybody, but I have to turn around and say, for your own safety, if you are not registered on what is called the NRSO, the Register for Sex Offenders, you can be in the position of a coach, position of any management, position as classifiers, position as referees, as administrators, you can be held and find criminally guilty if there is any abuse that takes place within your organization. And you, as the administrator, will be held accountable. So when we have a look at this, and we have a look at the reporting structure. Yes, there's templates that are there, and this template is available for anybody to report via. Okay, let's take an example. Um, we had an incident that took place at the national schools competition uh, during December, where one of the coaches was screaming and shouting uh, at his players, and he happened to use a little bit of vulgar language. There was a safeguarding officer that reported in from um, SRSA, and there was a threat that if this coach continues to swear at his players, he would be incarcerated, locked up, reported through to the um, um, child protection unit, and in this particular case, be charged criminally for his actions. Now, people may turn around and say, well, that's a bit harsh. It has existed in statutory law within criminal law for the time that, that, that the law was implemented in this country, which dates right back to the 1940s. So it's nothing new. All that it has done is that this document is now enforcing this statutory um, uh, platform and holding people liable for their actions. So when we turn around and say, okay, how do we report the matter? Well, it can be done in writing. A simple email, uh, a simple um, four or five liner uh, by whoever the case has been the victim. It can be by a phone call. It can be emailed to the national provincial club or even to the event safeguarding officer. It can be done in person. It can be done via sports voice, okay, through the website. Again, by email, through the app, or WhatsApp line, which is all provided via these, these um, groups that look after uh, the safeguarding policy. When we examine the situation, we need to be very, very careful because whoever has received the report needs to apply everything they possibly got and realize that before that report can go further, they need to investigate it, find out if it is is a true report or is an, or it is made up, establish the facts, get witnesses, um, uh, basically find out what type of harassment it was, what type of abuse it was, and then thereafterwards take that matter to the second level. We will then investigate it. So no matter what incident can be reported, we need to protect the so-called whistleblower. Now, that means that it can be somebody on the outside watching in that reports an incident where a vulnerable person has been abused or harassed. And we call this the complainant. Okay, and this complainant needs to, if he is making a report, he needs to make a valid statement. Okay, when we do this valid statement, it is normally made to such an extent that it is a an affidavit. An affidavit is a document that is a statement where the person swears uh, before his God 
that it is true and nothing but the truth. And if it is false, that person that made that statement can be held criminally liable as well. So any complaints that, that we follow has to be done via the following ways. First of all, it needs to be by phone, email, written uh, report, uh, or via the WhatsApp line that will be provided for this document. It has to go through, if there's a safeguarding officer at the event, that has to be reported via the safeguarding officer. The safeguarding officer must be beyond reproach, cannot in any way be biased or friends with somebody that, that has done the abuse, and if so, has to recluse themselves from the particular investigation. Once the safeguarding officer has made this initial assessment of this complaint, he needs to then take the matter further and make a formal complaint to what we call the safeguarding board. Now, the safeguarding board will make a determination. Is this a criminal offense? Does it border on sexual harassment? Was it physical abuse? If it was physical abuse, assault, and or sexual harassment, then the matter is referred immediately to the police. And the police then handle this matter via the criminal act. If the matter is not considered to be a matter of the police, then the safeguarding officer will refer the complaint to what we call the independent investigation organization or to the case management group. The case management group in WBSA will consist of myself, Michelle Mokonadi, and the HR director, Mr. Spongili Fondini. Those are the three people that have been put in play to accept the complaint and, and gather further information and investigate the complaint. Once this group considers that this complaint is valid, again, it refers back to was there a criminal element inside there? If so, reported uh, through to police. If there's no criminal element, they will proceed with the internal investigation. They'll resolve the matter, the matter internally, and they'll either dismiss the complainant as unfounded, Now, this company that exists will do a safeguarding online webinar for 600 bucks, okay? We've looked upon it. We're looking into it right now, myself and, and Jerry. And the understanding is, is that um, we will invest in it where it is absolutely necessary for our high-performance coaches. And then, of course, something called a declaration of good standing has to be signed off by the clubs and by the provinces. And this is put on record that if an incident takes place, it can be clearly shown to the SAPS that we have completed safeguarding training, the implementation is in play, and that we have met compliance. If we don't have it in play, of course, it becomes a criminal procedure. Sorry, Charles, can I no. interrupt a hand up from Marinda? Please ask questions. Please go ahead. Go ahead, Marinda. Uh, just unmute your mic. Okay, we'll come back to Marinda. So a part of this policy now, and this is directly towards coaches, coaching staff, referees, classifiers. Any person that is dealing with a national program, with a coaching program, includes provincial coaches, club coaches, they have to, one, be cleared 
off the sexual offenders register. Two, they have to be cleared off the child protection register. Three, they have to be cleared from a criminal record. Once the three entities are taken care of, then they will sign something called a declaration of good standing. This basically is a document that says quite clearly they are free from all criminal element. Then on top of this, yeah. they've got to sign the WBSA Code of Ethics, which is this document plus the HR policy. And then lastly, after all of this has taken place, that coach will be awarded with a safeguarding awareness certificate. Now it's gonna cost money. If we use this particular company, it's gonna cost us 260 Rand to get all three police clearances done. Otherwise, you will need to go to the police station yourself and get the clearances taking place. And then to do the online guarding, and this is something we're looking at right now, it's gonna cost another 126 Rand to get a, certif a certificate to be cleared to carry on with your coaching. Now we have to seriously look at this because we understand that money is tight, that everybody doesn't have the money to go through the safeguarding certification. And we are trying to, to find out that if we pay a conducive fee to these particular agencies, would we be able to do it for the people that are coaching our, not only our children, but coaching our structures? Any questions so far? Uh, yes, sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Miranda. <laughs> this is Miranda. I think I could hear. I just want to ask, um, you said it's our safeguarding officers in the women's rep and in clubs. Um, what about the schools or do they have their own type of policy? What about the any reps in the schools, the safeguarding Miranda, reps? Absolutely. So any school should have already appointed a safeguarding person. Okay, and it'll be very interesting to find out if within the schools they've done this, because this oh. policy was submitted through the Department of Basic Education. And from my understanding that uh, the policy is already within the curriculum of school compliance. Oh. I, I must be very honest with you. I haven't gone and investigated this matter at this time but it's part of the program that I'm dealing with mm -hmm. with the uh, Department of Basic Education and Sports and Recreation to find out whether the safeguarding compliance has been implemented within our structures. And Charles, I can maybe come in. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'm a, a wheelchair basketball coach at a school and um, as a, um, a person working um, under the education um, department, you have to have um, one, two, and three already in place. Um, so all of the new staff uh, have their criminal checks and everything done. Um, we have a whole bunch of agreements that um, we sign. Um, I, I know that... Um, uh, physical abuse, those types of agreements are all signed um, that everyone understands what it means and that it's not allowed in any schools. Um, but as far as the safeguarding um, officers, I'm not sure that the schools are clear on this. Is this one person for every sport code or could it be one person for um, all sport at school? Yes, correct. It's, it's actually one person for the school. Okay, and then under that particular person, they can create the commission of various members of staff that sit upon this commission as well and assist. Um, but as it stands at the moment, um, within the the sports federation side, there has to be a safeguarding officer for clubs, for province, and for high performance structures. So that's. <laughs> I cannot say at this stage. I would need to find out more about that. The problem is, Joel, sorry, and that'll be my last one, is when we go away then, at the end, to nationals, they have people not in schools making the safeguard offices. Mm -hmm. And there, I think, might have to be a change that for the people involving directly with the children 
to be the safeguard officers or they allocated a safeguard officer for wheelchair uh, basketball um, uh, that during nationals because children are very unlikely to go to somebody that they don't really know um, when it comes to things they would rather go to. So do you know what I mean? So the whole yeah. Western Cape team, of course, we don't know each other yet. And then out of that team, make a safeguard officer for nationals for that. Okay. And then maybe uh, soccer, their team made a, um, you know, if we, I think that might work a little bit better for nationals, having a specific safeguard officer for specific sport on nationals, during nationals. Yeah, Maria, you're saying? absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct in what you're saying. And yeah. it is something which, unfortunately, sports and recreation have not implemented correctly. If you go through this particular document, each, each structure must have the safeguarding person in play. Okay, so what would happen as a sport as a whole at the nationals, for example, there would be one person from sports and rec and from basic uh, um, department of basic education that will be assigned to wherever that event is taking place. But at the same time as saying this, yes, we are dealing with underage children. And when we deal with underage children, they must feel confident to talk to somebody within their own environment. And I agree with you 100%. And it's something that we are, are pushing for is that when you do travel with a team or a, a conglomeration of a team, then appoint a person that has gone through the training, that understands procedure, and that individual must be well known that, look, this is the person, there's anything that's taking place that you report the matter through. And of course, the person must be independent. You cannot have somebody that is there, that is friends with the coaches and friends with the administrators, uh, because then we are really and truly not in compliance. Because if it happens to be a close friend that we're having coffee with all the time, uh, by no means will a safeguarding officer report what is taking place. Um, and, and we need to understand this. So yes, it's a hell of a lot of information that needs to be put together right now. Um, I am Mm, astounded that they're enforcing this particular policy and yet there's been no training done on it. So from my side, I encourage you as a province and encourage you as provincial schools to look after yourselves, look after your children. Yes, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. So that's it in a nutshell, all right? The actual document itself, as I said, is, is 75 pages. Um, the reality of it is at this stage, uh, it took me five days to study this particular document, to go through it very carefully, uh, because all the questions that you are asking is covered within this document. And it specifically works by code, by code, by code. So if I can go back to page one and just say that this document covers in totality each particular member. So when we talk of children, there's five pages on protection of children. Talk of young adults, another five pages, and so on and so on and so on. So it is designed, and they, and they call it um, um, chapters. There's a chapter per structure that we are dealing with. Okay, the latest structure that has been added to it, of course, is the vulnerable adult that talks about trans people and and um, uh, the 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 big story that's happening now within transgender sport and how to deal with it if you are uh, in a position where there has been abuse against gay and transgender people. And that's a different community altogether. Uh, when we talk about, about vulnerability, um, it, it, it deals more with psychological. Um, and then comes the abuse side of it, 
where in the actual environment, transgender and, and gay people are being physically attacked and abused by parents, which is a concern as well. And we need to really be aware of what's happening around us. Uh, I don't need to talk about elderly people, uh, the abuse that's happened that we've seen on carte blanche and we're reading in the newspapers on how elderly people have been abused constantly when they don't adhere to what the caregiver tells them to do. I don't need to talk about women in South Africa. Uh, it's, it's, it's all of you have your own stories. What this safeguarding document is all about is that we must be able to freely talk about this and assist where we can assist. Um, my biggest concern is physically disability, okay, is to have a look at the number of players in the last five years that have either died of pressure sores or, or are completely out of the system because of pressure sores. And this is just unacceptable. It just physically means that within our particular programs, within our clubs, within our physical teams, we are not having a person that is checking up on this type of neglect. And of course, the under 18 age group and the children age group is a different chapter altogether. And it goes in that, that when we talk about these type of things, a coach must never be alone with a child at any given time. Even if it's one-on-one -on -one training, there must always be a second person that is present observing what takes place. When we talk of male coaches with female teams, we have to be very, 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 very aware that in the young adult group, okay, where young ladies are, are coming into maturity and they have their periods, how can they discuss these particular matters with a male coach? They cannot do so. So the encouragement to bring female coaches on board uh, to deal with female teams is something that is discussed in this document. If there is a male coach, there has to be a female manager, there has to be a female assistant, and there has to be a female medical person. And this is covered within the actual documentation. When we talk of physically dis physical disability, we need to understand what disability are we dealing with? And if this particular disability, is it the fact that they are paraplegic? Are they amputees? Are they polio cased individuals, spina bifida? And whoever that person is dealing with it needs to understand all of the dangers that come through with dealing with physical disability. We don't deal so much with mental disability, uh, but physical disability is a crisis amongst us. And we need to understand that when we deal with physical disability, we have to understand the limitations that come through with it. Neglect. If I have a look and see what's taken place over the last couple of years, and specifically with the under-19 championships, how many times our disabled people are put onto 64-seater buses where they have to be carried up and over, over stairs put within it where there's no opportunity of stopping and going to the toilet and there's no caregivers that are provided that deal with this in specific. And these are the things that, that, that we have to identify and deal with in a most courteous manner. Competitive athletes, the more and more we're dealing with competitive athletes, the more and more we're finding out the abuse that is coming about. Okay, we have to take into consideration that when we're dealing with it, abuse is what we feed them. You cannot expect a high-performance athlete to survive when we are giving him food that does not build muscle, that does not contribute to uh, the competitiveness that needs to be done. We need to have a look at the bedding that he sleeps on. We need to understand that if we are running camps with the disability that the shower facilities and toilet facilities are disabled friendly. That the motor vehicles that we're putting them in is disabled friendly. All right, I asked a question 
last weekend whilst doing this particular safeguarding statement amongst the administrators on those adults, those kids that go home to the townships when they when they physically go home for for rituals or for cultural gatherings. Okay, where do they go to the toilet? Because the toilets are long drops. What happens if it is rainy? Are they able to go to those particular toilets? The answer is no. Okay, so where do you go and toilet? In Buck. Whoever is the competition's manager needs to be fully aware that when he's running for disabled athletes, when he's running for children, when he's running for elderly people, that all of these avenues need to be looked upon and dealt with prior to the event. Unfortunately for wheelchair basketball, every single one of the seven uh, um, vulnerable aspects that we talk about fall under disability. So we are exempt from turning around and saying, oh no, we can't take care of this, we can't take care of that. We have to take care of it. And we have to put these safeguards in play to ensure that LD people are not abused, that our women have the freedom of talk, that our competitive athletes are looked after, that our physically disabled have the correct medical treatment, all of this is neglect, and that our youngsters do not have the fear of being abused by their coaches, by their mentors, let alone be kidnapped, let alone be left after hours waiting for their parents to be picked up. All of this is covered within the school structure. All of this is covered in this document. And what it has basically done, apart from the fact that when I saw this and I nearly had 25,000 heart attacks, the realization is, is that if this is not in play, we as Wheelchair Basketball South Africa and our affiliates are doing a disservice to our members. And that's me finished, guys. Any questions?